All right, good morning, everyone. As we kick off our uh, 2016 Children and Nature Network Conference, I'd like to introduce the Executive Director of the Children and Nature Network, Sarah Milligan Topman. Well, good morning, everyone. It's so great to see everyone here this morning. Hope you had a good evening last night. It was great to see so many of you at the welcome reception. And if you're just joining us this morning, we welcome you here. It's so wonderful to see so many faces from all over the world. You know, one of the great things about this movement, I think, is that while we share a passion for a connection to nature, it's a very personal thing. Hello. Sorry, a little feedback there. It's a, most of us have a, a very personal, deeply personal sometimes, connection. That connection means something to us very deeply. And I was reflecting on this this morning on my run along the Mississippi River. I'm an avid runner, and I try and get outside most days if I can. And just moments from where we are right here in the heart of downtown St. Paul, you can be along the shores of the Mississippi River. And I was hoping that an eagle might swoop down and you know, catch a fish, so I'd have a great story to tell you that didn't happen. But um, I did see a heron while I was out there. But I was contemplating and really reflecting on the river this morning. And the mighty Mississippi, one of the great rivers of the world, is just right here. And thinking about how it connects our country from north to south, and how it sustained generations before us, and hopefully many generations to come. And I was grateful. And I realize that that's often what happens for me when I'm in nature, is that I get a sense of gratitude and perspective. I kind of get my head right. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important that we have these opportunities for nature connections right outside our front door. And we'll be doing a lot of thinking and working and talking about that today. So this room is full of people. I understand there's more than 650 people registered for the conference this year. And folks from more than uh, at least 18 nations from around the world, so just incredible. But I'd like to get a little better sense of who's in the room here. So if this is your first time being at a Children and Nature Network conference or gathering, raise your hand. Oh my goodness. Well, we hope to see you for many years to come. Thank you so much for being here. And let's see the veterans in the room. Who have been to one or more conference? over the years. Well, welcome back. We're so glad to see all of you. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, let's have a little love for Minnesota. Who's here from right here in Minnesota? All right, we've got, woo! And if you traveled from outside the US to be here today, raise your hand, please. Look at all of these people. Well, it's just incredible. Thank you all for being here. We're just so thrilled, obviously, to have you all here. Okay, I need to click my slide. So this is the 10th anniversary of the Children in Nature Network. We started 10 years ago when uh, a book called Last Child in the Woods was written, and some people decided that it was really important that we galvanize uh, and organize a movement uh, to reconnect kids to nature. And as my friend and colleague Juan Martinez likes to say, you know, the Children in Nature Network is all about that action. And uh, that's what we're about here uh, for this conference. And uh, we're going to be working hard over the next few days to create uh, creative solutions to uh, create abundant and equitable access to nature for, for all of our children. So, some people have been asking me, and I've been thinking about this, you know, what is next for this movement? What's it going to take? What's the next step? Where are we headed here? And I don't claim to have the answer to that um, question. Move here. Um, but I do have some thoughts about what are the big levers that we need to pull to <coughs> turn the tide on this thing we call nature deficit. And as you, you'll see that it kind of lines up with the sessions and tracks that we're going to be doing here over the course of the next few days. So you can decide whether that's a coincidence or not. Um, so the first thing I think we really have to think about is engaging children and families where they are, and that is in cities. Um, today, five and a half in 10 people live in urban centers. This is worldwide. And over the next 30 years, it will be eight in 10 people. 
think about that. That's pretty profound. And that really presents, I think, a tremendous opportunity for all of us in this room to think about how we work in and with our city leadership to create abundant and equitable access. And today's whole agenda is about that, so I hope you take full advantage of that. Second, we, we need to... Sorry. <laughs> Second, we need to uh, in, engage educators and the use of our public school grounds for the healthy development and education of our children. Uh, in the U.S., I'm not sure about how it is worldwide, but I know in the U.S. a very small percentage of our public school grounds um, use or have outdoor learning spaces that are used. They may have them, but they may not be used to educate children. In fact, many of those school grounds are locked up at night. You can't even get into them after school hours. And I really feel like the fact that these public lands are not being used for the healthy development and education of our children is really an outrage. And I hope that you'll uh, take advantage of the opportunities to connect with educators and leaders in, uh, in this movement over the next course of the next few days to really chart a course for the future of education that includes nature as a context for learning. Number three, nature access or the lack thereof is really a public health issue and I think this movement needs to frame it as such and even more we now need to get the data to back us up. Uh, on Thursday, Dr. Ray Baxter uh, from Kaiser Permanente will be talking about nature as medicine and I hope you all can attend that session and participate in some of the health track sessions. Fourth, we have to engage families. I mean, that's kind of a no-brainer, but we have to figure out how to help families break down those barriers to uh, spending time in nature together. And we have many great sessions uh, throughout the conference where folks will be working on that issue. And fifth, we need to support and grow emerging diverse leadership in the movement. Uh, if you're 35 or under, will you raise your hand? Okay, look at this room, all right? We have, the leaders are here, okay? We have the leaders, the, the leaders are in the room, and we need to continue to work cross generations um, to build this movement together. And um, I hope we'll take advantage of the opportunities over the next few days to think about how we can encourage, nurture, and support this emerging diverse leadership in the movement. So I think the cross-sector collaboration that's happening here this week is really representative of what's happening in the children and nature movement worldwide, and it's very exciting. And I just, you know, as I'm going to recognize our sponsors in just a moment, but I, I want to say this is really an exciting time in this movement, and I just uh, am so excited to be with all of you here as we embark on the next three days and then what's to come uh, over the next few years. I'm excited to work with you on that. Okay. Oops, oh, there's the mayor, it's Clarence. Yep. All right, we'll get to our sponsors here in a second, I think. Oh well, maybe, can you forward it back there? Okay, thank you. We just need to get to our sponsor slide. Um, we couldn't do events like this without great partners, and we are so blessed to have amazing partners supporting us in this, in this conference and who are helping us to be able to put on the many great events that you're going to participate in. So I'd like to start by recognizing our presenting sponsor, PlayCore, our founding sponsors, the Canadian Wildlife Federation and the Disney Conservation Fund, who got behind us before we even knew what this thing was. Our other major supporters are Landscape Structures, REI, Wilderness Inquiry, Bannon Stock Natural Playgrounds, and Wells Fargo. And we have additional supporters whose contributions we really appreciate. The Johnson Family Foundation, the Conserved School, the National Park Foundation, Chad and Maggie Dayton, the Children's Hospitals and Clinics of Minnesota, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota, Texas Children and Nature, the Camping and Education Foundation, Dodge Nature Center, and the Minnesota Zoo. Isn't it great that it's such a long list? Wow. Um, and the, yes. Give them a round of applause. But there's more. Um, the we also had scholarship support that was generously provided by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Environmental Education Foundation, the Alana Institute, and Wells Fargo. And these folks allowed us to provide scholarships for people to come that might not otherwise be able to be here. And then we had great in-kind support from Clean Canteen, Kind Bars, and Algonquin Press. 
So I would now like to introduce um, my good friend, longtime colleague and mentor, Greg Lace, who is the founder and executive director of Wilderness Inquiry. Wilderness Inquiry is generously underwriting today's activities at our Cities and Nature Summit. And um, I just will say that I kind of learned everything I know from this guy. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you very much for everything. And congratulations on a great conference. And I, I would say that I know the work of Sarah Milligan Toffler, and uh, it's evident here today. So thank you. I, I want to get a round of applause for her. So, um, you know, we're not the typical conference sponsor, I wouldn't say. In fact, this is the first conference we've ever sponsored. and. Uh, but when I thought about it, you know, the mission alignment between the Children and Nature Network and Wilderness Inquiry is really perfect. I mean, our mission is to introduce new people to the outdoors, and we do that all over, all over the country, in the city, uh, and internationally, and including today, we're going to take some of you on the Mississippi River. I hope some of you from other countries are going to come out and paddle with us if the rain holds. Mayor Coleman, that's in your department. So. Um, you know, I would just say that we're thrilled to be here. We're thrilled to be a part of the Cities Connecting Children with Nature Initiative, too, which is part of the theme of the day. And I would tell you, Sarah, that um, we'll make a commitment right now to next year for next year's conference, too. Woo! So there you go. Yeah. So last night, I thought I heard uh, Rich Louvre say something at that very fun reception. I don't know how many of you are at the reception at the Science Museum, but I thought I heard him say something like, you know, they wanted to build a wall around St. Paul and get Minneapolis to pay for it. Did any of you hear that? I kind of heard that through the den and clutter at the Science Museum. <clears throat> so I want to leave you with a thought, um, paraphrasing another presidential candidate, and the thought is this, that it takes a city to raise a child in a nature-rich environment. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Greg, and that is a great segue into um, the next person that I'm going to introduce, our great partner and friend, Clarence Anthony, who is the Executive Director of the National League of Cities. Clarence, will you come on up? And Clarence is going to be introducing our keynote speaker for this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. What a great day to be in St. Paul, and it's a wonderful opportunity that I have uh, to introduce uh, who I call a, a friend. And you know, when you when you talk about someone, you you really get a chance to introduce them. You um, you try to find words that really uh, resonate uh, with yourself as well as the audience. Um, there's a quote that Mayor. Coleman has said, and, and I want to paraphrase it, and he said, I believe in the power of government to benefit the common good and help people improve their lives. And so as I introduce him, I want to use three words, uh, leadership, commitmentship, I know that's not a word, that's a Washington word, that's my word. <laughs> and it's huge to paraphrase another, um, anyway. Um, <laughs> leadership, commitmentship, as well as friendship. And so, um, as we talk about leadership, and you think of uh, Mayor Coleman, you talk about his life and the fact that he has served the public and served St. Paul for most of his life. Um, he served on the city council of St. Paul, and then uh, in 2006, he was elected mayor. And from there, he has been able to really show leadership around a number of issues. But one of the ones that he's really had a passion about is inclusiveness. He's had a passion about bridging the gap between students of minority communities and majority communities. He continued to talk about leadership in nature and cities 
as he served as president of the National League of Cities. And that has transformed our organization. It changed the way in which we looked at the connection between nature and cities. And his work continues now uh, as a past president. As you think of commitmentship, you also think of the fact that he's transformed uh, the city of St. Paul, bringing issues of climate sustainability and making sure that everything that is built, every piece of public policy includes that concept. And the fact that social and academic opportunities beyond the school day continue to be a theme from the beginning to today. So you look at a person and their life and what they're committed to, it really shows commitmentship. And then you think of friendship. He's a friend of nature. He's a friend of, of children. He's a friend to building networks and movements that transforms not just St. Paul, but cities all over America. And so as we look at, uh, we provide this opportunity for you to hear from him, I also want you to know that friendship extends beyond his work. I am truly a friend of Mayor Coleman. I will tell you that anyone that sees us together, you'll always see smiles. You'll probably hear him say some mean things about me after I sit down here today. <laughs> but his passion for music is what we both um, share. And so if you want to talk to him about Bruce Springsteen, you want to talk to him about the first person I thought about when I heard that Prince had trans position on in his life, that was the first person I thought about calling because we share that, that passion of friendship and music. But also, he taught me how to do the windshield wiper. You guys don't know what that is, right? Yeah. What is it called? Oh, the sprinkler. I mean, it's not a pretty sight. It is not. He also taught me how to do the lawnmower. How do you do that one? <laughs> and he also taught me uh, what true friendship is about. And I would like to uh, present to you guys uh, the mayor of uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, a man that I, I truly love and, uh, and appreciate in my life. Mayor, Mayor Chris Coleman. <laughs> Just, just to prove it, we didn't even have to coordinate. <clears throat> we have our Prince Purple on today. <laughs> so we're, we're good, we're good. Thank you. Thank you, Clarence. And I, I do intend to say nasty things about you once you sit down. Uh, I was so shocked that you didn't say anything mean about me that I, I don't know what to say now. Um, Clarence has been an unbelievable leader of the National League of Cities, uh, served as mayor of his hometown for 20 years. Uh, and was a past president of the National League of Cities. And so he really understands the importance of networking and the importance of partnership and, and relationships. Uh, but also, and most importantly, he understands the power that cities have to get things done. And so just so, uh, so glad to have him as a partner here. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, welcome, first of all, to the, the greenest uh, convention center in the country. Uh, we are the gold standard of, of uh, green. We have solar panels. We have a uh, recycling program second to none. Uh, we have been uh, recognized by multiple rating agencies for our, uh, the sustainable nature of this facility. Uh, so we're very proud of it. But one of my favorite stories in Ann Hunt, who is my environmental policy coordinator, somewhere here in the audience, uh, I got a call from Craig Leopold, who was the owner of the Minnesota Wild. And he, and he was just like, you know, Mayor, we, we want to do these sustainable things, uh, but, but, you know, just could you back off just a little bit, you know, have that, could you have Ann not call me all the time? Um, and I said, sure. Of course, I said, Ann, ramp it up. Let's get, to, let's, let's, let's do, let's do even more. So I reminded Craig of that story a couple of years later when he was receiving all these awards uh, for his sustainability, and he was kind of glad that we didn't back off on that. 
uh, but it's an example of what you can do from a city level. Uh, the second thing I want to do before I actually start my remarks is can the, the visitors from other countries raise their hands again? All right, so most of them are over here. You guys didn't get the memo. We want the foreigners over there. <laughs> Most importantly, I want people to recognize them. And if you're, if, you're an Amer if you're from the United States, could you please adopt them and try to explain Donald Trump to our foreign visitors? <laughs> I know it's confusing, but don't worry. It's confusing to us, too, so we're, we're not sure. Well, I'm glad to be here today uh, to speak. First of all, I'm, I'm just very happy that all of you are here uh, to, today to celebrate kids in nature, uh, to celebrate the connecting that we do to get kids involved in outdoor play, uh, to understand the importance of that for social emotional learning and growth. Uh, I come by this work uh, <clears throat> partly just out of a pure passion myself for nature. Uh, I grew up in a family that really celebrated being outdoors. Uh, and I always kind of thought of it as the big outdoor adventures going off to the national parks or going up to the Boundary Waters Canoe area. And, and what I realized as I was kind of preparing my remarks for this, I spent most of my time outdoors just in, in the woods behind my house, uh, you know, just going through you know, to that, that wonderful experience that I'm sure a lot of us as kids remember when you, you know, you're first playing in the woods and you kind of don't understand what those burrs are. And then your mom's got to cut your hair to get all those burrs out of your, you know. First she tried peanut butter. I said, why are you putting peanut butter in my hair? And she said, it's not working. I'm just going to cut all of it off. And, um, so that's, that was my first exposure to nature. Uh, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't fun. Uh, later on, I realized that it actually could be more than that. Uh, and I got, to, I got a chance to go to Outward Bound. That was my graduation present. Uh, I did a 25-day mission or Outward Bound trip up to the Boundary Waters uh, as a, as a, uh, just after my freshman year of college. I went out to Glacier National Park to work at East Glacier Lodge for the first summer. Went out to the Tetons the next summer, went back to Glacier. Uh, all of those experiences were really incredibly important to me, really shaped a lot of uh, my thinking about kind of, first of all, my own skill sets, uh, what I was capable of doing, but also how important it is to get other uh, kids that same opportunity that I had. And so many years ago, uh, uh, five or six years ago, we began this program to try to get kids out to Glacier National Park. Uh, and this is one of, uh, one of my favorite pictures of all the pictures that I've been associated with. And not that I was in this picture, but to see these kids, uh, this is just off the High Line Trail, uh, that have kind of have never imagined what the mountains would be or what wilderness really was, to be out in Glacier National Park for five or six days, hiking, uh, camping, uh, cooking outdoors, doing all those things. Just an incredible uh, opportunity, uh, and, and I know how important these opportunities are uh, and how transformative they are. If you were at the lunch, uh, the, the funders lunch yesterday, uh, there was an oppor uh, opportunity to hear from a young woman who just said, "Going out to Glacier was transformative for me," and now she's paying it forward to a whole group of other young uh, young adults, uh, kind of teaching them about the importance of being out in the wilderness. So I absolutely, I just love this picture. But one of the things it reminds me of is how the, all the different pieces of getting kids outdoors, uh, all the different parts of that uh, equation. First of all, the partnerships that you have to have. We have uh, partnerships with this program with the National Park Service, Wilderness Inquiry, which I uh, am proud to be a, a member of the board of. Uh, we've had our, national, our Parks and Rec Department that has really led this effort, the St. Paul Public School System and the AVID program, which is Advancement via Individual Determination. The kids that were going out to Glacier were participants in the AVID program, which is dedicated towards, towards uh, kids that were heading off to college, but probably the first ones in their family to have ever gone to college. Uh, and it took this incredible partnership, uh, not the least of which was, uh, in, you know, was uh, private, uh, I guess, philanthropic funding for us to be able to do this. Uh, an incredible program that really, uh, again, is transformative um, for those kids that get to go on the big trip but also the network that we put together to get them just outdoors uh, in our own backyard. Um, some of you may remember when Ken Burns spoke, or uh, did his, um, his uh, documentary on the National Park Service, one of the conversations that came out of that is how few people of color are getting out into the wilderness. Um, and and the, the, the disconnect that we have because wilderness and that, that kind of, uh, that uniquely American thing to preserve large tracts of wilderness uh, was being missed out on by a lot, a huge segment of our population. 
Um, and, and we talked about it from, he talked about it from different perspectives, but one of which is, for those of us that care about our national parks as we celebrate our 100th anniversary, a lot of that is, who's gonna be 50 years from now fighting for preservation of our national parks if we're not exposing all of our children to that opportunity? Because at some point, 50 years from down the road, somebody's gonna have to be supporting the Glacier National Park Foundation or the National Park Foundation itself or any of these other things. And so, so there's a self-interest for those of us that care about uh, um, wilderness that goes beyond the social emotional learning that happens in the individual. But this is about building a future generation of supporters for our, our, our great tracts of wilderness and we need to do that. You know, I, I, all of you I suspect in this room could speak more eloquently to, to, to these issues than I can because you live it, you work it every day. But we know how important it is for us to get kids in nature and we know how poorly we're doing at that. Uh, we have, uh, on average, our kids are spending seven and a half hours plus a day in front of a screen. They're spending seven minutes outside. Uh, that, that is a disconnect that really needs to be uh, dealt with somehow. You cannot ha continue to have kids that have no exposure, and again, not, not talking about going on big trips out to the national parks, but just going out in their own backyard, having those exploration opportunities, going through the woods. When you, when you live on the banks of the Mississippi River, there's all kinds of opportunities if we can get our kids out there, but they're spending so much time uh, in front of a screen that they never even think about going outside. Um, and it's, it's, it's problematic for a whole lot of different reasons. You know the health consequences of that. Uh, when we're seeing more and more kids with early onset of type 2 diabetes, we know that we need to do something. We know that we need to get our kids more physically active. Um, and the best way to do that is to create opportunities for them locally to do that and, find, and form the partnerships that are necessary to make that happen. Um, you know, it, it, the, Richard has done such an amazing job of raising awareness of this issue and the de uh, nature deficit disorder. Um, but again, when I first started thinking about this, I thought about it in the, you know, the great nature tracks of it. But more importantly, and I, as I've come to realize it, is we, there's so much that we can do on a local level to get our kids, just get them outside, uh, get them engaged, uh, and get them exposed to being outside. But our kids are afraid of outdoors. They, you know, they're, they're, uh, it's, a, it's kind of amazing. When we talk to kids and we, we talk to them about going camping, uh, it is the scariest thing that they can think of. And a lot of these kids are exposed to gunshots regularly in their neighborhood. They're exposed to levels of violence in their neighborhood, uh, and, and a lot of times in their own homes. Uh, but for them, frightening is actually having to sleep outside uh, because it's unknown, and it's, it's really a scary thing for them. But that's one of the things that we can, you know, by just slowly exposing our kids to nature, uh, we, can, we can help them understand that they don't have to be afraid of uh, being outside, uh, that they can embrace it and enjoy it. Uh, we, there's no question that, that cities can be leaders uh, and innovators on this. Uh, first of all, we have to be because the majority of the world's population is living in cities right now. Uh, we have the resources and the, and this, uh, the, the tools at our disposal. Uh, we are leading on sustainability efforts. Uh, we are leading on, uh, on a lot of different fronts. If you looked at, I, I had a, the great fortune to go to Paris for the climate uh, conference this last uh, December. Uh, this is a picture of, of all the mayors from across the globe that had gathered over 400 plus mayors uh, in, in Paris for the climate change. And, and mayors, it was, we were the cool kids on the block. It was really kind of fun because, because people, uh, while on one level they were talking about what they were going to do about climate change, the mayors were getting together and talking about what we, what we were doing about climate change and what was actually happening and how we were making a difference. Uh, and it was really great to be part of that. We can take that same level of leadership, we can take that same level of partnership uh, and spread the connection of kids to nature uh, across the globe and really start to, to make a difference. Um, you know, from the beginning, uh, I've been mayor now for over 10 years, we have really tried to put kids at the center of our policy making. Uh, we really tried to understand that, that when we are reaching out to our kids, trying to close the achievement gap, trying to help them uh, develop healthy lifestyles, trying to figure out how to uh, make them, you know, give them opportunities, uh, that it, is, it answers so many of the questions that we have on any level. When you think about, you know, I, I, particularly around education, um, 
I, I've always said education is my economic development strategy, is my crime fighting strategy, is my neighborhood uh, development strategy, because if our kids get the education that they need, if they have the tools that they need to be part of a 21st century workforce, um, then all of those other challenges that we have uh, about you know, uh, crime rates and all those things, if our kids are working, if our kids are in school, uh, all of those other issues go away. And so from a city standpoint, we have to have children at the center of our, our, of our policy making um, and we have to have them, uh, you know, uh, we, just all of the resources that we can muster have to relate somehow back to the closing this achievement gap. It, it's really a disconnect for those of you that aren't from Minnesota. Uh, we, we take great pride. If you look at the statistics, Minnesota's at the top of almost any chart on educational attainment. We're at the top uh, on, on, on employment. We're at the top on housing ownership. We are at the top of so many different things. The problem is we have among the greatest divides between our white communities and our communities of color of any place in the country. Uh, and, and people are starting to understand, not only is it a moral imperative that we change that, it is an absolute economic imperative because we're a very high-tech economy in the Twin Cities. We have a, we have a diverse uh, group of, of companies and, and sectors. But the fact of the matter is you have to have uh, a certain amount of education to be able to take jobs in those uh, sectors. And if we're leaving over half of our kids behind, if our kids aren't graduating from high school on time, if they're not graduating with the skill sets that they need, uh, our economy, in the not, not in the long distance future, but in the very short distance future, will begin to collapse because we don't have the workers that we need to be able to fill those positions. And so there's, there's a whole lot of energy coming around understanding that not only the moral imperative of closing the achievement gap, but the economic imperative of doing it as well. And I, th and I think that um, getting kids in nature uh, exposing them to the outdoors becomes a center piece of that. We have a thing, we have a, our version of Stri Cincinnati has Strive, uh, ours in the, in the Twin Cities is called a Generation Next, uh, that kind of 360 degree approach to education. Uh, and we fought for a long time to get a specific bandwidth, uh, not just about you know, third grade reading levels and eighth grade math levels and graduation rates, but a very specific bandwidth around social emotional learning. Uh, because I'm increasingly convinced that this lack of developing those skill sets that you need to be successful, grit, determination, all, all of those things that uh, encompass the non-cognitive skills are, are as, as important as reading, as, as math. Uh, you have to have, you have, we have to help our kids develop those skill sets in order to be successful uh, and, and there's no better way to do that than connecting our kids to nature. We have a lot of different programs that can go on. We've developed an out-of-school time network called Sprockets. Uh, we have a very strong, very healthy Promise Neighborhood Initiative that, that is making great strides. Um, we have summer youth employment called Right Track that also involves opportunities for kids to work in the outdoors. Um, and, and we're continuing to, to kind of put all these pieces together. We've had in, in Minnesota, we've had a great fortune uh, a few years ago. We passed a three-eighths of a cent sales tax uh, we call it the Legacy Amendment, where those funds are dedicated to, uh, to, to the outdoors, to wilderness, but also part of those funds are dedicated to developing leadership in the outdoors and really putting programs together uh, to help in, for environmental education and, and a lot of those pieces. So uh, if you don't have a, a similar program in your states uh, or, or your countries, you've got to figure out this is a resource issue at some point. Uh, we're very fortunate in the, in the state of Minnesota to have some of those resources uh, available. In, in St. Paul, this is really kind of, it's an all hands on deck approach. Uh, it obviously, parks and recreation are the center of our connecting our kids to outdoors. Uh, we have incredible programs in, in, uh, in, in uh, a lot of different um, uh, areas. Uh, we, have, uh, we have bee sanctuaries and we have programs in our, in our parks and rec department uh, to get our kids outdoors. Uh, we have a lot of different uh, ways that we go about it. Uh, but it's not just Parks and Rec, it's our libraries. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about our nature backpacks uh, in our libraries that help uh, expose our kids to the outdoors. 
It's our police department taking kids out, not just taking them out fishing, taking them out biking. Uh, we have a program in our police department called Safe Summer Nights, an incredible community partnership uh, where, where once a week during the summer in a different neighborhood, the cops just come out, they start barbecuing for kids, they're outdoors, uh, they, have, they bring out equipment, they bring out uh, jump castles, they bring out all these things just to get kids, first of all, out and engaged, but also to help them get to know their, their police officers uh, to help building those relationships. Uh, and it's really, it's a great thing to see, uh, and, it, and it does work. But it isn't just, you can't just say, well, this is, you know, this is Parks and Rec's department's job, uh, and everybody else gets a pass. Uh, the most effective way that we can go about this is to engage every aspect of, of, of our city uh, and get, you know, figure out public works is, a, is an incredible, you won't necessarily think about it, but think about bike paths and how important it is to get our kids, uh, make it easier for them to ride their bikes to school or, or to a playground, et cetera. So our public works department becomes a, a huge piece of that. But we also have uh, incredible, um, you know, we have a great park system in the city of St. Paul. Um, we, we're, this is a battle, this is why I want to build a wall between Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, because we, we're always kind of in, we're in a very healthy competition between our two cities. Last year, uh, the, we were co-named uh, as the number one park system uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the United States of America by the Trust for Public Lands. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of great to, the, the fact we're, we're challenging each other is to help develop uh, a better park system uh, and, and really uh, encouraging each other to, to figure out how we can get more of our kids outdoors. Uh, and it's a great, and as I say, a healthy competition. So I mentioned the, uh, the role that libraries can play in the, in the, in the backpacks in our libraries. Uh, we have this great program uh, that, uh, that puts these, uh, has, gives kids access to these backpacks that, uh, you know, it might have them, uh, there might be cards about animals that they would spot outdoors and, and kids can, can kind of go out and start exploring or bugs that they, could, that they can find. Um, we've, had, we've had camping programs at Sunray Library. I think some of you are going to go over today and see the Sunray Library. Uh, the funny thing is we've had kids camping out at Sunray Library uh, in the rec center over there, but uh, then the people keep on calling the cops and saying there are, there are kids that are camping out in our parks. And we're trying to like, you know, yeah, that's, that's actually a plan thing. We kind of want that. Um, so, you know, but, but what's interesting about the Sunray Library is uh, we have an outdoor reading garden there. Uh, we have a nature nook, we have a pollinator garden, uh, we're going to be hosting uh, uh, a hive of bees uh, over there um, in addition to the, the, the backpacks that we have. It is just really, it's amazing the things that you can do uh, when, you put, when, you, when you start connecting nature directly to the work that, that our libraries, our parks and other agencies are doing. Uh, we've also learned that it's important for us as we develop events, it's not just about the kids. Uh, a lot of our families have said, we really want to have inter, uh, multi-generational, intergenerational events uh, to connect our grandparents with their grandchildren and allow them opportunities to go ice fishing, uh, to, to just get outdoors. This becomes an important piece to, to focus in on this intergenerational piece. We also realize that a lot, of, particularly for our immigrant communities, a lot of folks are not, they just don't have a connection to the parks. And so we develop a parks ambassador program. Uh, we have just, uh, uh, in the Midway District, we have a very large East African population, and within a couple miles of them is one of the greatest regional parks that we have, Como Park, and, and our, the folks, the East, uh, the East African community that was living at 1247 St. Anthony had no connection to that park. Well, through the Park Ambassador Program, we got folks out to Como Park. Uh, they, they start to, you know, they, all of a sudden they realize that this resource was there uh, and it has made a huge difference in terms of uh, uh, kind of how they connect. This, this, the building that they're in is right next to the freeway, it's surrounded by Target and other kind of big large uh, concrete uh, pads. Uh, and, and so there was no connection at all between 1247 St. Anthony uh, and nature. But once they understood that nature was just, uh, you know, not that far away, uh, through the ambassadors program, we were really able to change their perception. Uh, and now this has become a huge resource for East African community. We, we've been really fortunate in the city uh, to develop great partnerships because we have the relationship with the National Park Service. 
uh, and we have the Mississippi River here. We've started the Big River Journey. Uh, it is a, basically, it's a, it's a classroom on a boat. I was uh, with a group of kids as they were going out on the boat a few, years, or a few weeks ago. Uh, it's targeted at third and fifth graders, or, or third to fifth graders. Uh, we've had over 70,000 kids participating uh, in this program over the last 20 years. Uh, that is, a, it's an amazing thing to have those, they'll have stations, uh, set up on the boat. The boat goes up and down the Mississippi River. They talk about the different animals and birds that they see. Uh, it, it, it is, it's so fun to see the reaction of those kids when they get on the boat uh, and, and actually get out on the Mississippi River. Frogtown Park and Farm is a great partnership with the Trust for Public Land. Uh, it was just this old uh, uh, home of a, of, of a foundation, the Wilder Foundation. Uh, we were able to procure the land through, with support through P Trust for Public Lands. Uh, and put green space in a place that was in desperate need of great green space in the Frogtown neighborhood of the city of St. Paul. Um, that was an idea that was started by just a couple of parents in that neighborhood saying, you know, we really got to figure out what we, what we can do with this uh, and create that opportunity to create green space. Uh, and so now there's a, it, it's a 13 acre site. It, it is going to have all different aspects to it, including a, a garden that the kids will be able to work on. Um, and it will be something that they can just walk to and be part of. Uh, we, we heard from Greg earlier about uh, the Urban Wilderness Canoe Adventures and Wilderness Inquiry. Uh, getting, getting kids out on the river, uh, and I've had a chance to paddle with them, uh, not just in, in St. Paul, but I, I was out in Washington, D.C. a couple summers ago, getting kids out on the Anacostia, and, and I, it's a kind of a similar experience to other, other things that I've witnessed. They are, they are deathly afraid of getting out on that boat, and by the time they get ready to get out of the boat, um, they're, they're just, they're so confident and they've just, they've just had a great experience. Uh, it's an incredible thing that, uh, that we see our kid, what happens to our kids when they have an opportunity uh, to do th things that they had never been able to try before. Um, we're really working to, to develop fully our riverfront to make it more accessible to kids uh, to, to get out on. Uh, we have a plan for an environmental learning center that would be a huge draw from really not just across the region but across the entire state of Minnesota uh, to get kids out on the Mississippi River. We hope to be moving forward on this fairly soon. If we could get a bonding bill from the state legislature, it would be a little bit easier. Uh, we, we've had a great partner with the Riverfront Development Corporation uh, to really kind of map out the future of the river and how we can make it more connected to, to the work that we're doing. Uh, we've developed a, a plan called the Great River Passage Plan. Uh, that is, uh, that is, you know, it's a 50-year plan, uh, but it's all about making sure that the that the city of St. Paul is connected to the river in a lot of different ways. Um, obviously, we're very, you know, the, the fact that, that we are in a national park or just across the street from the national park uh, is is an amazing resource uh, that helps open up a lot of different partnerships. Uh, we're very excited about that. Um, even in places where you don't necessarily think about the connection to nature, we need to start thinking about that connection. So uh, a year ago we opened up the Green Line, which is the light rail line that runs between downtown St. Paul and downtown Minneapolis. Uh, it goes through the University of Minnesota campus, a bunch of different uh, employment centers. But we made sure that as we were building out that, that design, that there was just even a tree canopy. Uh, that there were, there were just open park spaces along the way uh, so that it wasn't just a concrete jungle and it, wasn't, it didn't just look like a freeway, that it really was connecting, uh, even in small ways, uh, kids to nature. Uh, the West Side Flats, which is a plan for development across the river, uh, really understanding that you start with park space and open space uh, as kind of a key to it uh, because, because if you just build, we, we've made that mistake in the past in this country, building huge concrete jungles uh, where there is no connection to nature uh, is a terrible thing. It's a terrible, it's a terrible thing for the families that live there. Uh, and we need to continually to put green space and, and, and open space at the center of all of our designs. Um, I get, actually get paid for every time I use the phrase vibrant places and spaces. Uh, I don't, it just it's in my contract. This is a tagline that we, that we use. But it really, we really are trying to create vibrant places and spaces. That's another dollar. Um, the, but, but really trying to, you know, just activate uh, whether, again, it's bike paths uh, or it's, it's open space in front of schools uh, or it's just how we connect our streets uh, to, to our neighborhoods. To really make sure, uh, if, if any of you know the work of Gil Penalosa in 880, uh, this has been really driving, uh, about three, four years ago, Gil gave a speech to the Riverfront Corporation dinner uh, and really brought this home to us, 
that we've got to create places that are walkable, that are bikeable, that work for kids that are 80 or 8 years old, that work for people that are 80 years old. Um, and if you build a system that works for 8 year olds and 80 year olds, you're really building a community that does have vibrant places and spaces, but makes it, uh, it, it makes it easier for kids to get outdoors. Um, you know, we're very proud, this is, uh, um, very proud of our park spaces in the city of St. Paul. Uh, but most importantly, we're very proud of the partnerships that we have um, with all the different agencies. These are the urban wilderness canoes, getting kids outdoors, uh, getting them out fishing, uh, taking advantage of this incredible beauty that we have here. Uh, and so I just, I, you may, I, I'm not a big PowerPoint guy, right? So I've just done a PowerPoint. Um, but here's what I want to talk about. This is, uh, this is just a thing that I'm, I'm so passionate about. I know what happens when we connect our kids to nature. And again, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, you know, in the backyard or it's out in one of our national parks. Uh, I had, in, 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 and if you've heard me speak at all on this topic, you've heard me tell this story. But years ago, uh, three or four years ago, uh, I was out in Glacier National Park with the kids that we sent out from the St. Paul Public School System. And I got a chance to hike uh, along the High Line Trail with, uh, with a group of kids. And I was behind this one young man, maybe 15 years old or 16 years old. And as he got out, on, if you've ever been out to Glacier and you're on the High Line Trail, uh, the first big stretch of the High Line Trail is just a sheer cliff. And you have to hold, there's a, about, the path is about the size of this podium. You have to hold on to a guy wire uh, as you go along it. And as I was walking down this path, <clears throat> this young man, with every step he took, got smaller and smaller and smaller. And by the time he got to the end of this section, he sat down on a rock, and I said, let me get a picture of you. And he said, no, 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 I don't want you to take a picture, I, I'm crying. So I said, I said, what's going on? How can I help? And he said, he said I'm deathly afraid of heights. I am, I am just absolutely petrified. Uh, and that was like the scariest thing I've ever done. He said, but I'm actually crying because I am so happy to be out here. I am just, this is the most thrilling thing I've ever done in my life. So we went out, we hiked for a couple more hours, we went up to the pass, we played around, the kids got to go off and explore, they came back, we were hiking back along this exact same stretch of wall. And as they walked past this next, this, this stretch uh, the second time, uh, all the adults were reminding this young man, hold on to the guy wire, would you pay attention? He was up, you know, he was just kind of bouncing around, talk, playing with his water bottle, uh, not, he was so carefree. And that same section of the, of the path that had brought him to his knees a couple of hours earlier, by virtue of him being out there and conquering that fear and having a chance to explore nature, he was, his, the confidence that you could see just exploding that young man in just that short period of time was amazing. And what I realized at that moment was what happens when we give our kids a chance to explore, uh, to, to conquer their fears, to do things that they never thought they were capable of doing. If we deprive our children of that opportunity, we are depriving them of the key building block to success in my mind. That skills that, that, that says, you know what, I can overcome difficult situations. I can overcome challenges in my life. Uh, if, you, if you look at all of the research around social and emotional learning, grit, determination, all of those skill sets, that uh, executive leadership skills, whatever you call them, uh, are absolutely necessary to embed in our children. Because you can have them do drills on math questions, you can have them do reading programs, you can have them do all those things. But unless they internalize in themselves that they can accomplish whatever they want to accomplish, all the drills in the world won't make a difference. There is no better place to impart those skill sets than getting our kids outdoors, getting them out on the Mississippi River, getting them hiking in a glacier or uh, on a trail in Glacier National Park, uh, exploring bees in a, in a, in a, in a, in a park next to, to their house, whatever it is, we, are, we owe it to our children to make this happen. All of you are part of that. All of you are engaged in that work, and you are engaged in what I think is the most important work that we can do. So, as the mayor of the city of St. Paul, as a kid who just enjoys wilderness and knows how important it was for me personally, I want to just thank you for your work. Keep it up. Let's help our children succeed. Thank you.